Section 3 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Movements of Our Population by Henry Gannett. Presented before the Society, December 9, 1892. Part 1. The Total Population. By the movement of population is to be understood its numerical increase, its geographic distribution over the country, and its composition as regards sex, race, and nativity, not only at present, but in past times. This is a broad subject, and in an attempt to compress it within the limits of a single paper it will be impossible to go deeply into details. I shall attempt only to develop the principal features and to bring out their mutual relations. The first permanent settlement within the original area of the United States was made at Jamestown, Virginia, in 1607, the next at Plymouth in 1620. These were followed nine years later by the settlements at Salem and Boston. In 1623, the Dutch settled at New York. From 1631 to 1634, colonies were established on Kent Island and St. Mary's on the shore of Chesapeake Bay, and in 1638 at Wilmington, Delaware. In 1664, settlements were established at Elizabeth, New Jersey, and on Cape Fear River, North Carolina, and six years later on Ashley River, North Carolina. The settlements in Pennsylvania began in 1681. It was not until 1733 that settlement was established in the present state of Georgia, in the neighborhood of what is now the city of Savannah. The early colonies suffered many hardships and dangers and grew but slowly. Bancroft estimates their people at approximately 200,000 in 1688, three quarters of a century from the time of the first settlement. He estimates the population in 1750, nearly a century and a half after the first settlement, at 1,260,000. Ten years later, in 1760, it was 1,695,000. In 1770, it was 2,312,000. And in 1780, 2,945,000. Thus, at the outbreak of the Revolution, the population of the colonies was probably not far from 2,500,000, of which it is estimated that 2 million were whites and 500,000 blacks. In 1790, the first census of the United States was taken. From that time to the present, a census has been taken every ten years. For a century, therefore, we have a trustworthy record of our numbers. Starting a century ago, with 3,929,214 inhabitants, we have gone ahead by great leaps as shown in the following table and diagram, until our country contains today 62,622,250 people. Population of the United States by Decades Census Years Population Percent of Increase Census year, 1790, population, 3,929,214. Census year, 1800, population, 5,308,483, percent of increase, 35.10. Census year, 1810, population, 7,239,881. Percent of increase, 36.38. Census year, 1820. Population, 9,633,822. Percent of increase, 33.06. Census year, 1830. Population, 12,866,020. Percent of increase, 33.55. Census year, 1840. Population, 17,069,453. Percent of increase, 
32.67. Census year, 1850. Population, 23,191,876. Percent of increase, 35.86. Census year, 1860. Population, 31,443,321. Percent of increase, 35.57. Census year, 1870, population 38,558,371, percent of increase, 22.66. Census year, 1880, population 50,155,783, percent of increase, 30.07. Census year, 1890, population 62,622,250. Percent of increase, 24.85. The diagram, plate 6, shows by the lengths of the bars the population as returned at each census. The difference between their absolute lengths representing the numerical increase from census to census, and their relative lengths the proportional increase. In the first 25 years, the population doubled. In the second 25 years, it doubled again, the population in 1840 being four times that in 1790. But in recent years, the rate of increase has diminished. Instead of doubling in the last 25 years as it did in the first half century of our history, it has required 30 years the population in 1890 being almost precisely double that in 1860. In the early decades of our history, the rate of increase ranged from 36 to 32 percent. Between 1840 and 1850, it rose again suddenly to nearly 36 percent, owing to the first rush of immigration. Between 1860 and 1870, the check due to the Civil War is strongly emphasized. The rates of increase shown by the figures are extremely large as compared with those of European nations, many times larger than that of France, several times larger than that of Great Britain, and greatly in excess of that of Germany. Indeed, in rapidity of growth, no other civilized nation of history has ever approached this country. While in the past 30 years this country has doubled its population, France has increased but 3%, Great Britain and Ireland 29%, and Prussia 62%. Since 1797, Prussia has increased in number from 8,700,000 to 30 million, while this country has increased from 4 or 5 millions to 62,622,250. Nor is this tremendous increase due in any great degree to immigration since in all probability as shown later the earlier rates of increase would have been nearly maintained by the excess of births over deaths had there been no immigration while in the united states as a whole the population has increased during the century at this marvelous rate individual states show the widest possible range in their rates of increase as a group the thirteen original states have never gained so rapidly as the United States as a whole. Their rate of increase has always been smaller than that of the country. The reason for this is that throughout our history, these states have furnished the brain and brawn for the settlement of the West. There has been a continuous stream of emigration from the Atlantic border to the Mississippi Valley, the Plains, the Rocky Mountains, and the Pacific Slope. Millions upon millions of young men and women of the East have left their homes to found empires in the West. In the northeastern states, this drain has since 1847 been in large part made up by foreign immigration, and thus has the character of the inhabitants of these states in great measure been changed from the pure English stock of revolutionary times. In the South, there has been no flood of immigration, and the losses which these states have sustained have been repaired only in part by the fecundity of the people. On the other hand, in the newer states where settlement began since we became a nation, 
the rate of increase of population was at first extremely large and then diminished down to the present time but it has not diminished uniformly or continuously because of certain disturbing elements in the progress of settlement of this and perhaps other countries there is a certain order or sequence in the occupations followed by the majority of the people an order which accompanies and is closely related to the increasing density of the population after the pioneers or hunters trappers etc commonly follow herdsmen and ranchmen as the first settlers the raising of cattle which requires a wide range of country for pasturage is the prominent industry of a newly opened territory then farmers come and gradually crowd the herdsmen out the land is occupied in small parcels and affords sustenance to a much larger number but the time ultimately arrives when the population becomes too dense for profitable farming and a portion of the people taking the hint given them by the increasing hardness of the times enter other avocations and so manufactures and commerce take their beginnings and gradually grow and multiply until the farmer finds himself in the minority the body of people are engaged in making things instead of raising things now when a nation or state approaches the limit in density of population of successful farming it does not pass easily and freely into a manufacturing community there is more or less trouble there are hard times and a depreciation of values for a while it is a sort of dead point in the machinery but when the change is effected or on the way to be effected prosperity once more beams upon the community this is not an ideal case we have before us in the states of ohio indiana illinois and iowa and in parts of adjacent states examples of communities which are now passing through just such a crisis the growth of population in these states is at present very slow the farmers are getting crowded while other industries are not sufficiently advanced to take their place a quarter of a century ago southern new england was in that situation but has now emerged from it and having become a manufacturing section is exceedingly prosperous and the population is increasing again with great rapidity the increase being essentially urban this change involves more than a mere change of avocations to these states it involves a shrinkage of farm values enormous in total amount the gathering of the people together in cities and an enormous increase in values therein the settled area now let us trace the spread of the population over our domain as it has increased in number its progress across the continent is indicated by the maps plate seven representing the status of settlement at the beginning and end of the century the colored area on each map represents the settled area of the country at each date it being understood that by the term settled area is meant all that country which contains two or more inhabitants to the square mile anything less than that being regarded as unsettled but first a word about our territorial limits in seventeen ninety our territory was limited on the west by the mississippi river and on the south by the northern line of florida in eighteen o three the enormous territory of louisiana was added by purchase and shortly thereafter oregon was acquired by prior settlement in eighteen twenty one florida was acquired from spain in eighteen forty five texas having achieved its independence from mexico was admitted as a state in eighteen forty eight the southwestern territories were acquired from mexico by the treaty of guadalupe hidalgo and in eighteen fifty three the gadsden purchase completed the territory of the united states as it exists at present with the exception of the detached territory of alaska in seventeen ninety we find settlements stretching continuously along the atlantic coast from maine to georgia and occupying the greater part of the atlantic plain at several points it stretches feebly westward up the mohawk river in new york crossing the mountains in pennsylvania and maryland and stretching down the appalachian valley in eastern tennessee while in northern kentucky in the neighborhood of cincinnati 
quite a body of settlement has appeared, isolated from the rest. Each succeeding decade has seen the frontier line pushed westward, crossing the Appalachians, stretching gradually across the great valley of the Mississippi and climbing the plains. With every succeeding census, we see new isolated bodies of settlement off beyond the frontier at points where the exceeding fertility of the soil, facilities for Indian trading, or valuable mines have attracted the pioneers. These centers have grown and spread until their margins have touched the main frontier line, and they have become merged in the great body of population. In two or three instances, bodies of population which have grown up under foreign powers have fallen under our jurisdiction by the acquisition of territory. Among these are the old French-Spanish settlements of southern Louisiana, the American-Spanish settlements in Texas, and the Spanish settlements of New Mexico, Arizona, and California. In 1860, settlements of magnitude first appeared in the Rocky Mountains and on the Pacific Coast. Those in California consisted of gold hunters, and those in Utah of Mormons. In 1870, these settlements had spread widely. To the gold hunters of California had been added thousands of farmers who were subduing the broad acres of the Sacramento Valley. The Mormons had increased and multiplied, and gold hunters had spread into Idaho and Montana. The second of these maps, Plate 7, Figure 2, representing the status of settlement in 1890, marks an epoch in the history of our settlement. The frontier line has disappeared. The settlements in the far west have spread and joined one another. The settlements from the east have traveled up the plains and have joined those in the mountains at many points, so that the settled area has become the rule and the unoccupied places the exception. It will soon be useless to advise young men to go west and grow up with the country, for the country is rapidly growing up. Percent of increase of settled area and of population. Census years, area, population. Percent of increase, area, population. Census year, 1790, area, 239,935, population, 3,929,214. Census year, 1800, area, 305,708, population, 5,308,483, percent of increase, area, 27.41 percent of increase population 35.10 census year 1810 area 407,945 population 7,239,881 percent of increase area 33.44 percent of increase population 36.38 Census year, 1820, area, 508,717, population, 9,633,822, percent of increase, area, 24.70, percent of increase, population, 33.07, census year, 1830, area, 632,000, 717. Population, 12,866,020. Percent of increase, area, 24.38. Percent of increase, population, 33.55. Census year, 1840. Area, 807,292. Population, 17,069,453. Percent of increase, area, 27.59. Percent of increase, population, 32.67. Census year, 1850. Area, 979,249. Population, 23,191,876. Percent of increase, area, 21.30. Percent of increase, population, 35.87. Census year, 
eighteen sixty area one million one hundred ninety four thousand seven hundred fifty four population thirty one million four hundred forty three thousand three hundred twenty one percent of increase area twenty two point oh one percent of increase population thirty five point five eight census year eighteen seventy area one million two hundred seventy two thousand two hundred thirty nine population thirty eight million five hundred fifty eight thousand three hundred seventy one percent of increase area six point four nine percent of increase population twenty two point six three census year eighteen eighty area one million five hundred sixty nine thousand five hundred seventy population fifty million one hundred fifty five thousand seven hundred eighty three percent of increase area twenty three point three seven percent of increase population thirty point zero eight census year eighteen ninety area one million nine hundred forty seven thousand two hundred eighty five population sixty two million six hundred twenty two thousand two hundred fifty percent of increase area twenty four point zero six percent of increase population twenty four point eight six the settled area at each census has been measured and the results compared one with another the table presents the rates of increase of the settled area compared with one another and also with the rate of increase of the population it is seen that while the settled area has increased at a rapid rate the population has increased in each case still more rapidly center of population the distribution of the population is summarized in the position of the center of population and its movements are likewise summarized by the movements of this center the center of population is the center of gravity of all the inhabitants of the country computed under the assumption that each individual is of the same weight and presses downward with a force proportional to his distance from the center in seventeen ninety this center of population was located near baltimore in the northern part of chesapeake bay in the century which has elapsed this center has moved westward decade by decade the stages ranging from thirty six to eighty one miles with an average of about fifty miles per decade now it varies northward a trifle in its western course as the weight of settlement has been attracted northward and again southward perhaps by the addition of texas with its body of americo mexican people but generally keeping a consistent course toward the setting sun in one hundred years it has moved westward five hundred and five miles in eighteen ninety it rested for the time in the southern part of indiana near greensburg still far however indeed many degrees of longitude from the geographic center of the united states which is in northern kansas midway between its eastern and western lines it will doubtless be centuries before the center of population will approach the center of area of the country position of the center of population in each decade census years north latitude west longitude approximate location by important towns westward movement during preceding decade census year seventeen ninety north latitude thirty nine degrees sixteen point five minutes west longitude seventy six degrees eleven point two minutes approximate location by important towns twenty three miles east of baltimore maryland census year eighteen hundred north latitude thirty nine degrees sixteen point one minutes west longitude seventy six degrees fifty six point five minutes approximate location by important towns eighteen miles west of baltimore maryland westward movement during preceding decade forty one miles census year eighteen ten north latitude thirty nine degrees eleven point five minutes west longitude seventy seven degrees thirty seven point two minutes approximate location by important towns forty miles northwest by west of washington district of columbia 
westward movement during preceding decade thirty six miles census year eighteen twenty north latitude thirty nine degrees five point seven minutes west longitude seventy eight degrees thirty three point o minutes approximate location by important towns sixteen miles north of woodstock virginia westward movement during preceding decade fifty miles census year eighteen thirty north latitude thirty eight degrees fifty seven point nine minutes west longitude seventy nine degrees sixteen point nine minutes approximate location by important towns nineteen miles west southwest of moorefield west virginia westward movement during preceding decade thirty nine miles census year eighteen forty north latitude thirty nine degrees two point o minutes west longitude eighty degrees eighteen point o minutes approximate location by important towns sixteen miles south of clarksburg west virginia westward movement during preceding decade fifty five miles census year eighteen fifty north latitude thirty eight degrees fifty nine point o minutes west longitude eighty one degrees nineteen point o minutes approximate location by important towns twenty three miles southeast of parkersburg west virginia westward movement during preceding decade fifty five miles census year eighteen sixty north latitude thirty nine degrees zero point four minutes west longitude eighty two degrees forty eight point eight minutes approximate location by important towns twenty miles south of chillicothe ohio westward movement during preceding decade eighty one miles census year eighteen seventy north latitude thirty nine degrees twelve point o minutes west longitude eighty three degrees thirty five point seven minutes approximate location by important towns forty eight miles east by north of cincinnati ohio westward movement during preceding decade forty two miles census year eighteen eighty north latitude thirty nine degrees four point one minutes west longitude eighty four degrees thirty nine point seven minutes approximate location by important towns eight miles west by south of cincinnati ohio westward movement during preceding decade fifty eight miles census year eighteen ninety north latitude thirty nine degrees eleven point nine minutes west longitude eighty five degrees thirty two point nine minutes approximate location by important towns twenty miles east of columbus indiana westward movement during preceding decade forty eight miles the above table and plate eight show the position and movement of the center of population during each decade density of population the following table shows the density of the population or the average number of people to the square mile at each census density of population by decades census years area density census year seventeen ninety area eight hundred twenty seven thousand eight hundred forty four density four point seven five census year eighteen hundred area eight hundred twenty seven thousand eight hundred forty four density six point four one census year eighteen ten area one million nine hundred ninety nine thousand seven hundred seventy five density three point six two census year eighteen twenty area one million nine hundred ninety nine thousand seven hundred seventy five density four point eight two census year eighteen thirty area two million fifty nine thousand forty three density six point two five census year eighteen forty area two million fifty nine thousand forty three density eight point two nine census year eighteen fifty area two million nine hundred eighty thousand nine hundred fifty nine density seven point seven eight census year 
1860, area 3,026,500, density 10.39. Census year 1870, area 3,603,884, density 10.70. Census year 1880, area 3,603,884, density 13.92 census year 1890 area 3,603,884 density 17.37 the map plate 9 figure 1 shows the density of population in 1890 by states in southern new england that is in massachusetts rhode island and connecticut the average density of population is as great as in many old European countries. Indeed, in Rhode Island, there are 318 inhabitants to the square mile, in Massachusetts, 278, and in New Jersey, 193. These are all manufacturing states. In the agricultural states of the South, the density ranges up as high as 41 in Virginia and 46 in Kentucky, while in the agricultural states of the Mississippi Valley, we find a density of 68 in the state of Illinois and 61 in Indiana, the average being in the neighborhood of 40 to the square mile. Urban Population In the term urban population, the census office includes the inhabitants of all cities of 8,000 or more. Of course, this definition is entirely arbitrary, and it may well be that urban conditions exist in places much smaller than this. Still, whatever limit is adopted, the conclusions to be drawn from historical comparisons hold equally good. The following table shows the urban population and the proportion which this bears to the total population at each census. Census years, population of the United States, population of cities, Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population. Census year 1790. Population of the United States 3,929,214. Population of cities 131,472. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population 3.35. Census year 1800. Population of the United States, 5,308,483. Population of cities, 210,873. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 3.97. Census year, 1810. Population of the United States, 7,239,881. Population of cities, 356,920. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 4.93. Census year, 1820. Population of the United States, 9,633,822. Population of cities, 475,135. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 4.93. Census year, 1830. Population of the United States, 12,866,020. Population of cities, 864,509. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 6.72. Census year, 1840. Population of the United States, 17,069,453. Population of cities, 1,453,994. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 8.52. Census year, 1850. Population of the United States, 23,191,876. Population of cities, 2,897,586. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 12.49. Census year, 1860.
population of the United States, 31,443,321. Population of cities, 5,072,256. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 16.13. Census year, 1870. Population of the United States, 38,558,371. Population of cities, 8,071,875. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 20.93. Census year, 1880. Population of the United States, 50,155,783. Population of cities, 11,318,547. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 22.57. Census year, 1890. Population of the United States, 62,622,250. Population of cities, 18,235,670. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 29.12. A century ago, this country contained but six cities having a population of more than 8,000 each, and the urban population constituted but 3.35%, or about one thirty-third of the entire population of the country. Today, the number of such cities is 443, and their population 18 and a quarter millions, which is 29%, or not very much less than one-third of the entire population. The total population is about 16 times as great as it was a hundred years ago, while the urban population is 139 times as great. It has grown eight times as fast as the total population. This aggregation of the people in the cities is a natural and necessary result of the increasing density of population and of the consequent change in avocations, which was discussed above. It has gone on in this country at a constantly accelerating rate, and the acceleration will probably be in the future even more marked than in the past, as a greater part of our domain reaches and passes in density of population the limit of successful agriculture. Referring to the map, Plate 9, Figure 2, which shows the proportion of urban to total population, it is seen that the urban population of the country is confined almost entirely to the northern states, especially those on the Atlantic border. Indeed, in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey, the urban element is in the majority, and in Rhode Island more than three-fourths of the people live in its cities, while, on the other hand, the proportion in North Carolina, Mississippi, and Arkansas is but trifling, being less than five percent in each case. Now, if the urban element be subtracted from the total population, there is left what may be broadly characterized as the rural element. Plate 6 shows by the total length of the bars the population of the United States at each census, the shaded portion of each bar representing the urban population at each date, while the unshaded portion remaining represents the rural population. This element which in the early decades increased nearly as rapidly as the total population, has in later years increased much more slowly. Indeed, during the past ten years, its rate of increase was not much more than half that of the total population, while in several states there has been an absolute loss of rural population during the past decade, and in many others the gain has been much less than the average gain of the country. The increase of urban population has been more rapid during the past decade than at any previous time in the country's history, having in ten years increased from 22 and one half percent up to 29 percent. This great increase has, in the main, taken the form of additions to our larger cities, most of which have grown enormously. The numerical increase in our urban population in the past decade is 6,900,000 of which fully three million consists of additions to the 28 cities of 100,000 or more inhabitants. 
Chicago's half million in 1880 has become more than a million in 1890. St. Paul, Minneapolis, Omaha, Kansas City, and Denver have doubled or tripled their population. Our greatest city, New York, has apparently enjoyed a comparatively slow growth, but this is only apparent. New York's charter limits include less than one-half of the people whose business and social interests lie in that metropolis. The great majority of the people who sleep within an hour's ride of New York's City Hall are to all intents and purposes, except in name, citizens of New York. But, having their residence without its charter limits, they cannot be enumerated as its citizens. A close estimate of the people thus connected with the metropolis places their number at 3,250,000, or second only to London in point of population. This territory, tributary to, but lying outside of the charter limits of New York, has increased in population at a tremendous rate during the past ten years, while the growth of the city proper has been confined to the upper parts of Manhattan Island and the portion of the city lying upon the mainland. The downtown parts of the city have diminished in population during the past ten years. This means simply that the ground formerly occupied by residences is being taken for business purposes, that the lower part of Manhattan Island is becoming more and more devoted to business to the exclusion of residents. A similar state of affairs has long existed in London. London consists essentially of a number of municipalities under various names, of which one, the Corporation of London, occupies the center of the city, the neighborhood of St. Paul's. In 1881, this corporation had a population of only 50,000, while in 1891 it had become reduced to 37,000, owing to the extension of business and the consequent reduction in residents. The average size of families has diminished continuously since 1850, when statistics were first obtained, from 5.55 down to 4.93 in 1890. In that year, the largest families were found in the South and the smallest in New England, and in the frontier states, as shown on the map forming Plate 10, Figure 1. Sex. The last five censuses, that is, since 1850, have classified the population by sex. At each census, males have been slightly in excess of females, the proportion of males ranging from 50.56 up to 51.21 of the total population, as seen in the following table. Census years, sex, male, female. Census year, 1890, sex, male, percent, 51.21, sex, female, percent, 48.79. Census year, 1880, sex, male, percent, 50.88, Sex, female percent, 49.12. Census year, 1870. Sex, male percent, 50.56. Sex, female percent, 49.44. Census year, 1860. Sex, male percent, 51.16. Sex, female percent, 48.84. Census year, 1850. Sex, Male percent, 51.04. Sex, female percent, 48.96. As a rule, the proportion of males has increased, owing to the increased proportion of the foreign-born, which consists largely of males. In 1890, the proportion of males was greater than ever before, due to the fact that the proportion of the foreign-born was greater than ever before. In the civilized nations of the world, generally a different condition of things prevails, females being usually slightly in excess of males, as is shown in nearly every country of Europe. In the United Kingdom, Germany, Austria, Scandinavia, the Netherlands, and Spain, females are at present in excess. The sexes are distributed over the country in widely varying proportions, as is shown on the map Plate 10 Figure 2. The states colored red are those in which females are in excess of males. They are all located on the Atlantic border, 
and include most of the states of that part of the country. In the Mississippi Valley, generally males are slightly in excess, while in the newer states and territories of the Rocky Mountain region, males are largely in excess, owing, of course, to the fact that these are new regions in which society has not yet reached settled conditions. Race. The population of our country is composed, as regards race, of about 55 million whites, 7,500,000 of Africans or mixed bloods, a few hundred thousand Indians, and 150,000 Chinese and Japanese. The natives of China and Japan are comparatively trifling in number, and since the Chinese Exclusion Act went into effect, immigration has ceased, and except upon the Pacific coast, where nearly all of them are found, they form too trifling an element to require consideration. The Indians, most of whom are confined to the areas classed as unsettled, plate 7, figure 2, will be left to the ethnologists. The Africans present us with the spectacle of an inferior race, existing in juxtaposition with the whites, and, since the early part of the century, unaided by additions to their numbers from abroad. For seventy years this race existed in a state of slavery, for the last thirty more or less in a state of freedom. It is interesting to observe the progress of this race and compare it with that of the whites. This is presented in the following tables, the first of which gives the total number of each race, while the next table shows the proportions of the two races, given in percentages of the total at each census. White and colored population by decades. Census years, white, colored. Census year, 1790. White, 3,172,006. Colored, 757,208. Census year, 1800. White, 4,306,446. Colored, 1,002,037. Census year, 1810. White, 5,862,073. Colored, 1,377,808. Census year, 1820. White, 7,862,166. Colored, 1,771,656. Census year, 1830. White, 10,537,378. Colored, 2,328,642. Census year, 1840. White, 14,195,805. Colored, 2,873,648. Census year, 1850. White, 19,553,068. Colored, 3,638,808. Census year, 1860. White, 26,922,537. Colored, 4,441,830. Census year, 1870. White, 33,589,377. Colored, 4,880,009. Census year, 1880. White, 43,402,970. Colored, 6,580,793. Census year, 1890. White, 54,983,000. 968. Colored, 7,638,282. Ratios of white and colored population by decades. Census years, white, colored. Census year, 1790. White, 80.73. Colored, 19.27. Census year, 1800. White, 81.13. Colored, 18.87. Census year, 1810. White, 80.97. Colored, 
19.03 census year 1820 white 81.61 colored 18.39 census year 1830 white 81.90 colored 18.10 census year 1840 white 83.17 colored 16.83 census year 1850 white 84.31 colored 15.69 census year 1860 white 85.62 colored 14.13 census year 1870 white 87.11 colored 12.65 census year 1880 white 86.54 colored 13.12 census year 1890 white 87.80 colored 12.20 in 1790, the first census showed that the colored race formed nearly one-fifth of the population. In 1840, after 50 years had elapsed, during which time the country had received practically no increase from immigration, the proportion of colored had fallen to about one-sixth of the whole. In the next half-century, which closed in 1890, during which the white race has received great additions from immigration, that proportion had fallen to less than one-eighth of the whole population. Summing it up, the colored race forms today less than two-thirds the proportion of the population which it formed a century ago. The following table and the diagram forming Plate 11, Figure 1, represent the rates of increase of the two races. Decades Percentage of increase, white, colored. Decade, 1790 to 1800. Percentage of increase, white, 35.76. Percentage of increase, colored, 32.38. Decade, 1800 to 1810. Percentage of increase, white, 36.13. Percentage of increase, colored, 37.46. Decade, 1810 to 1820. Percentage of increase, white, 34.12. Percentage of increase, colored, 28.57. Decade, 1820 to 1830. Percentage of increase, white, 34.03. Percentage of increase, colored, 31.41. Decade, 1830 to 1840. Percentage of increase, white, 34.72. Percentage of increase, colored, 23.28. Decade, 1840 to 1850. Percentage of increase, white, 37.74. Percentage of increase, colored, 26.61. Decade, 1850 to 1860. Percentage of increase, white, 37.69 percentage of increase colored 22.06 decade 1860 to 1870 percentage of increase white 24.76 percentage of increase colored 9.86 decade 1870 to 1880 percentage of increase white 29.91 Percentage of increase, colored, 34.85. Decade, 1880 to 1890. Percentage of increase, white, 26.68. Percentage of increase, colored, 13.11. These rates of increase show that in only two decades of the century have the colored apparently increased more rapidly than the whites. The decades between 1800 and 1810, and between 1870 and 1880. The latter, however, is only an apparent excess, due to wholesale omissions in the enumeration of the colored people in 1870. The colored race has almost continuously lost ground in proportion to the white race throughout our history. 
although the birth rate of the race is decidedly larger than that of the whites its death rate as is evidenced by the mortality records of large southern cities is still greater being not much less on an average than double the death rate of the whites since the time of the first records the colored race has been practically confined to the southern states as is shown by the map showing the distribution in eighteen ninety where it has practically monopolized labor there has never been any northward movement of this people of magnitude sufficient to be perceptible in census returns indeed the only important movement among them is southward from the border states into those of the southern atlantic and gulf from the tobacco states into the cotton states plate eleven figure two shows the present distribution of the race in the northern states the proportion is less than five per cent of the population in the border states it is less than twenty five per cent while in the states along the atlantic and gulf from virginia to louisiana it exceeds twenty five per cent and in three states south carolina mississippi and louisiana more than half the population are colored the highest proportion is found in the first of these states namely south carolina where three-fifths of the people are colored and but two-fifths white the question has been asked has the condition of slavery or of freedom proved the more favorable to the numerical increase of the colored people the figures of the census give us a ready answer the increase has been more rapid under conditions of freedom in the thirty years preceding eighteen sixty the colored increased forty eight per cent while in the following thirty years during only twenty seven of which they were free and which included the disturbed period of the civil war and of reconstruction they increased not less than sixty eight per cent end of section three recording by Karen. Section 4 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Movements of Our Population by Henry Gannett Presented before the Society, December 9, 1892 Part 2 Nativity and Immigration It has often been stated that the strongest and most virile nations are the composite ones, those made up from a mixture of blood. If this be true, we are in a fair way to distance in this regard all other nations which ever existed. The blood of immigrants from all the nations of Europe, from the Mediterranean to the Arctic, to say nothing of the Negroes, Chinese, and Indians within our borders, threatens to make of us the most thoroughly composite nation the world has ever known. During the first half of the century just past, we received practically no immigration. Our numerical gain was produced almost entirely by natural increase. Indeed, immigration was not of importance until 1847 or 1848, when the famines in Ireland and the political troubles in Germany, occurring almost simultaneously, started immigration in this direction. But since that time, there has been a migration of peoples across the Atlantic to these shores, the equal of which the world has never seen. Within a generation and a half, 15,427,000 six hundred fifty seven people have crossed the atlantic and found homes in this country the table shows the number of immigrants in each ten-year period since eighteen twenty immigrants by decades eighteen twenty one to thirty one hundred forty three thousand four hundred thirty nine eighteen thirty one to forty 599,125, 1841 to 50, 
thirteen thousand two hundred fifty one eighteen fifty one to sixty two million five hundred ninety eight thousand two hundred fourteen eighteen sixty one to seventy two million three hundred fourteen thousand eight hundred twenty four eighteen seventy one to eighty two million eight hundred twelve thousand one hundred ninety one eighteen eighty one to ninety five million two hundred forty six thousand six hundred thirteen in the first of these periods the number was trifling between eighteen thirty and eighteen forty it rose to nearly six hundred thousand in the next decade it nearly tripled and between eighteen fifty and eighteen sixty reached two million five hundred eighty thousand between eighteen sixty and eighteen seventy the number diminished owing to our internal troubles but in the next decade it rose again higher than ever before approaching three millions and in eighteen eighty to eighteen ninety it reached the enormous number of five million two hundred fifty thousand more than one-third of the whole immigration almost double the number which came in the preceding decade and more than double the number which arrived in any other decade the following table shows the principal constituents of the immigration during each decade from which it appears that the irish british and germans have constituted the bulk of the immigration indeed down to 1860 other elements were trifling in amount between 1860 and 1870 scandinavians and canadians commenced to appear and have increased with great rapidity other elements and much less desirable ones such as hungarians bohemians italians and poles appear first in considerable number so recently as between 1870 and 1880 and indeed it is only within the last decade that any considerable numbers of them have come over the danger to be apprehended from them is not from the numbers which have already arrived for they are inconsiderable but from the fact that the immigration is increasing at a tremendous rate so that if continued for a quarter of a century they will become of considerable numerical importance principal constituents of the immigration nationality eighteen twenty one to eighteen thirty eighteen thirty one to eighteen forty eighteen forty one to eighteen fifty eighteen fifty one to eighteen sixty eighteen sixty one to eighteen seventy eighteen seventy one to eighteen eighty eighteen eighty one to eighteen ninety nationality canada eighteen twenty one to eighteen thirty two thousand two hundred seventy seven eighteen thirty one to eighteen forty thirteen thousand six hundred twenty four eighteen forty one to eighteen fifty forty one thousand seven hundred twenty three eighteen fifty one to eighteen sixty fifty nine thousand three hundred nine eighteen sixty one to eighteen seventy one hundred fifty three thousand eight hundred seventy two eighteen seventy one to eighteen eighty three hundred eighty three thousand two hundred sixty nine eighteen eighty one to eighteen ninety five years only three hundred ninety two thousand eight hundred two nationality ireland eighteen twenty one to eighteen thirty fifty thousand seven hundred twenty four eighteen thirty one to eighteen forty two hundred seven thousand three hundred eighty one eighteen forty one to eighteen fifty seven hundred eighty thousand seven hundred nineteen eighteen fifty one to eighteen sixty nine hundred fourteen thousand one hundred nineteen eighteen sixty one to eighteen seventy four hundred thirty five thousand seven hundred seventy eight eighteen seventy one to eighteen eighty four hundred thirty six thousand eight hundred seventy one eighteen eighty one to eighteen ninety six hundred fifty five thousand four hundred eighty two nationality england and wales eighteen twenty one to eighteen thirty fourteen thousand two hundred twenty five 
1831 to 1840, 7,796. 1841 to 1850, 33,353. 1851 to 1860, 253,444. 1861 to 1870, 226,570. 1871 to 1880, 444,337. 1881 to 1890, 657,280. Nationality, Scotland, 1821 to 1830, 2,912. 1831 to 1840, 2,667. 1841 to 1850, 3,712. 1851 to 1860, 38,331. 1861 to 1870, 38,769. 1871 to 1880, 87,564. 1881 to 1890, 149,000. 869. Nationality, Norway and Sweden, 1821 to 1830, 91. 1831 to 1840, 1201. 1841 to 1850, 13,903. 1851 to 1860, 20,931. 1861 to 1870, 109,298. 1871 to 1880, 211,245. 1881 to 1890, 568,362. Nationality, Denmark, 1821 to 1830, 169. 1831 to 1840, 1003. 1841 to 1850, 539. 1851 to 1860, 3749. 1861 to 1870, 17,094. 1871 to 1880, 31,771. 1881 to 1890, 88,132. Nationality, Russia and Poland, 1821 to 1830, 91. 1831 to 1840, 646. 1841 to 1850, 656. 1851 to 1860, 1621. 1861 to 1870, 4,539. 1871 to 1880, 52,260. 1881 to 1890, 265,088. Nationality, Hungary. 1861 to 1870, 7,800. 1871 to 1880, 72,969. 1881 to 1890, 353,719. Nationality, Italy, 1821 to 1830, 408. 1831 to 1840, 2,253. 1841 to 1850, 1,870. 1851 to 1860. 9,231. 1861 to 1870, 11,725. 1871 to 1880, 55,759. 1881 to 1890, 307,309. Nationality, Germany. 1821 to 1830, 6,761. 1831 to 1840, 152,454. 
1841 to 1850, 434,626. 1851 to 1860, 951,667. 1861 to 1870, 787,468. 1871 to 1880, 718,182. 1881 to 1890, 1 million 452,970. Nationality, France, 1821 to 1830, 8,497. 1831 to 1840, 45,575. 1841 to 1850, 77,262. 1851 to 1860, 76,358. 1861 to 1870, 35,986. 1871 to 1880, 72,206. 1881 to 1890, 50,000. 464. Nationality, Netherlands, 1821 to 1830, 1078. 1831 to 1840, 1412. 1841 to 1850, 8,251. 1851 to 1860, 10,789. 1861 to 1870, 9,102. 1871 to 1880, 16,541. 1881 to 1890, 53,701. In recent years, the character of the immigration has changed for the worse, not only by this increase of these undesirable nationalities, but in the fact that the character of the immigration from other countries is lower than heretofore in respect to wealth, education, and morality. Altogether, the changes which the character of the immigration has taken on in the past 10 or 15 years have tended to lower the standard of American citizenship and press upon us the question whether it is not wise to take steps for limiting immigration. Of the entire body of immigrants who have joined us, 4,504,128, or 28%, are Germans, 5,911,454 have come from the United Kingdom, 3,481,074 of which are Irish. The United Kingdom and Germany together have supplied two-thirds of the entire immigration, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark have furnished 1,067,548, while the contingent from other European countries has been comparatively small in amount. The constituents of the total immigration and of the immigration during the last decade are shown graphically in Plate 12. The Foreign Born what effect has the flood of immigration had upon the constitution of our population? In 1840, all our people were of native birth, with the exception of 600,000 newly arrived immigrants. In 1850, those of foreign birth constituted between 9 and 10 percent of our population. In 1860, this proportion had risen to 13 percent, and in 1870, to nearly 14 and one half percent. In 1880, it suffered a slight reduction, being about 13 and one half percent. But in 1890, it had risen to 14 and three quarter percent, while the foreign born found in the country in that year numbered no fewer than 9,250,000. These facts are set forth in the following table. Increase of the foreign born. Census years, native, native white, foreign. Census year, 1850, native, 20,912,612, native white, 17,273,804, foreign, 2,244,602. 
census year eighteen sixty native twenty seven million three hundred four thousand six hundred twenty four native white twenty two million eight hundred sixty two thousand seven hundred ninety four foreign four million one hundred thirty eight thousand six hundred ninety seven census year eighteen seventy native thirty two million nine hundred ninety one thousand one hundred forty two native white twenty eight million one hundred eleven thousand one hundred thirty three foreign five million five hundred sixty seven thousand two hundred twenty nine census year eighteen eighty native forty three million four hundred seventy five thousand eight hundred forty six native white thirty six million eight hundred ninety five thousand forty seven foreign six million six hundred seventy nine thousand nine hundred forty three census year eighteen ninety native fifty three million three hundred seventy three thousand seven hundred three native white forty five million eight hundred sixty three thousand eight foreign nine million two hundred forty eight thousand five hundred forty seven the following table shows the proportion which the native and foreign-born bore to the total population at each census since the distinction was first made and the maps in plate thirteen show where the foreign-born are located ratio of increase of the foreign-born census years native foreign census year eighteen fifty native ninety point three zero foreign nine point six eight census year eighteen sixty native eighty six point eight four foreign thirteen point one six census year eighteen seventy native eighty five point five six foreign fourteen point four four census year eighteen eighty native eighty six point six eight foreign fourteen point three two census year eighteen ninety native eighty five point two three foreign fourteen point seven seven the maps show their distribution over the country expressed in percentages of the total population state by state from this it is seen that the home of the foreign element is in the north and west the foreign-born have never invaded the south to compete in labor with the colored element indeed in the northern and western states there are found no less than ninety six per cent of the entire foreign-born element of the country now a glance at the constituents of the foreign element they repeat in a broad way the composition of the immigration plate fourteen figure one presents the constituents of the foreign-born population of eighteen ninety showing that the germans are in excess of all others numbering two million seven hundred eighty five thousand followed by the irish one million eight hundred seventy one thousand the british one million two hundred fifty one thousand the canadians nine hundred eighty thousand and the scandinavians nine hundred thirty three thousand these five nationalities comprise nearly nine-tenths of the whole foreign element the italians and russians each number less than two hundred thousand the poles only one hundred fifty thousand and the hungarians and bohemians but a trifle over one hundred thousand each how are these different nationalities distributed over the country the series of maps forming plates fourteen to sixteen show this expressed in the form of a proportion between their numbers and the total population of the various states from them it is seen that the canadians are found mainly in northern new england michigan minnesota and north dakota closely hugging the northern border the irish are found mainly in new england and new york comparatively few having wandered westward the germans are found from new york westward and in the greatest body in illinois michigan and wisconsin the scandinavians have settled as far north as they could and yet remain within our jurisdiction being found principally in wisconsin minnesota and the dakotas while the british are found scattered widely over the northern states 
these people are guided largely by temperature in the selection of their homes those from northern europe and canada settle in the far north the germans coming from a more temperate climate have settled mainly south of them as have also the irish what is the distribution of this foreign element as between urban and rural life as a rule the irish prefer urban life the great proportion of them settling in the cities the same is also true in an almost equal degree with the british the germans are somewhat less disposed toward urban life but still a large part of them far beyond their due proportion are found in our large cities the same is the case with the french canadians while the norwegians and swedes are much more disposed toward rural life and the great body of them are found away from the centers of population as a rule however the foreign population flocks to the cities in far greater proportion than the native element does in eighteen ninety the twenty-eight largest cities of the country contained a population of nine million seven hundred thousand or about fifteen per cent of the population of the country now the foreign-born element of these cities comprises a little over three million or almost exactly one-third of the total foreign-born of the country putting it in another way nearly one-third of the population of these cities is foreign-born while in the country at large only about one-sixth of it is foreign-born these cities contain therefore double their quota of the foreign-born element plate seventeen as to occupations it may be stated broadly that the foreign-born element is engaged in avocations lower in character than the native element principally in those involving skilled and unskilled labor while the proportion of them in the learned professions is much less relative to their numbers than among the native element while in eighteen eighty the foreign-born constituted about one-seventh of the population it was found that of lawyers clergymen physicians and teachers there were about eleven native-born to one foreign-born on the other hand among servants there was one foreign-born to little more than three native-born among unskilled laborers the foreign-born were in the proportion of one to two native-born while in skilled labor such as blacksmiths shoemakers and carpenters the proportion was also as one to two and foreign-born miners exceeded in total number the native-born this flood of immigration has produced other results in our population beyond the mere additions to our numbers and the admixture of blood it has lowered the average intelligence and morality of the community the illiterate of the northern states are mainly foreign-born the proportion of illiterates among them being four times as great as among the native-born again the criminals of foreign birth in the northern states are double their due proportion as compared with the native-born another result of importance has been produced it is a well-known law of population that in a broad general way as the population increases the rate of increase diminishes it is an illustration of the malthusian doctrine now it matters not in the least how this density of population is brought about whether it be by natural increase or by immigration the result is the same the rate of natural increase is reduced thereby i have made a comparison between the rates of increase of the native white elements of the northern and the southern states to ascertain approximately the effect of immigration upon our rate of increase and the results are presented in plate eighteen the southern states including in that designation all of the states east of the plains and south of mason and dixon's line the ohio river and the southern boundary of missouri and kansas have received practically no immigration the states north of this line and east of the plains contain eighty six per cent of the foreign element the remainder being mainly in the states and territories of the far west the rates of increase found among the whites of the southern states which are not complicated by immigration are represented by the dotted line of the diagram and while they exhibit some oscillations they show a general but not a great diminution from the beginning of our history to the end 
Between 1790 and 1840, the white population of these states increased 239 percent. In other words, the population of 1840 was 3.39 times that of 1790. In the succeeding 50 years, the population of these states increased 204 percent. That is, the population of these states in 1890 was 3.04 times as great as in 1840, the rate having thus diminished by only 35 percent. On the other hand, how is it with the northern states? In the first 50 years, during which there was practically no immigration, the rate of increase in each decade was considerably greater than in the southern states, and altogether during this half-century the white population of these northern states increased 389 percent, that is, in 1840, the population was 4.89 times as great as in 1790. Between 1840 and 1890, after separating from the white population of these states, the immigrants and their natural increase, and thus leaving only the native element, the rate of increase of the latter is seen to diminish remarkably. Instead of ranging from 34 up to 41 percent, as it did in the first half century, the rates of increase by decades become 23, 20, 15, 16, and 10, while the rate of increase for this entire half-century was but 112 percent, the native population in 1890 being but 2.12 times as great as that of 1840. This sudden and astonishingly rapid reduction of the rate in the North, following closely the appearance of the flood of immigration, can be attributed to no other cause. The rate of increase of the North is shown by the full line. The broken line, which commences at 1840 and runs up to 1890, being the rate of increase of the native element alone, while the full line, continuing on to 1890, represents the rate of increase of the entire population of the North, including the foreign element. It is an interesting coincidence that this rate of increase during the last decade was almost exactly the same as that of the South. I firmly believe, therefore, that the rate of our natural increase has been greatly reduced by the flood of immigration. By allowing the poor and oppressed of Europe homes in this country, we have substituted them for our own flesh and blood. I believe that if there had been no immigration, the rate of natural increase which prevailed before immigration commenced would have been much more nearly maintained, and our numbers would be nearly as great as at present. The sudden and rapid reduction of the rate of natural increase of the North during the past forty years I believe to be due to this flood of immigration, and it is a question whether we have gained by this substitution of a mixture of European for American blood. There is another result produced by immigration which is not so apparent, but which, it seems to me, is of great and far-reaching importance in connection with this question. As has been stated, the immigration consists, as a rule, of the lower classes, mainly of skilled and unskilled labor, and these millions of mechanics and laborers have filled and practically monopolized the lower classes of avocations in the North. In this way, they have forced the Native American element into the higher walks of life. The headwork of the country is practically in the hands of Americans almost as fully as half a century ago. Our industrial enterprises of all sorts are under the management of Americans, and the hewing of wood and the drawing of water have been assumed by the immigrant. The fact that the Native is still the ruling element probably accounts for the fact that the foreign element, in spite of its great numerical importance, has thus far exerted but a trifling influence upon our political, industrial, and social life. The Element of Foreign Extraction The effects of immigration on our population are not confined by any means to the foreign-born. Although to some extent Americanized, the children of the Irish Germans and Scandinavians retain many of their parents' characteristics. Measurably, they are Irish, Germans, and Scandinavians still. It is interesting, therefore, to note 
to what extent our population is composed not only of the foreign-born but of the children of the foreign-born and this information was obtained both in eighteen seventy and eighteen ninety moreover in eighteen seventy practically all the foreign blood in the country must have been accounted for by the enumeration of the foreign-born and their children since immigration had commenced on a large scale only twenty-two years earlier and it is not possible that there was any considerable number of children of the second generation in the country the element of foreign extraction in the united states in eighteen seventy numbered by this enumeration ten million eight hundred ninety two thousand and comprised about one-third of the entire white population of the country in eighteen ninety those born of foreign parents including the foreign-born numbered twenty million six hundred twenty six thousand and constituted thirty seven per cent of the entire white population of the country to this large number are yet to be added probably four or five millions in the second generation to complete the tale of foreign blood the distribution of the foreign-born and their children is illustrated in plate seventeen the highest proportion being in new england and the northwestern states indeed in the northern states east of the plains forty five per cent or nearly one half of the inhabitants are foreign-born or the children of foreigners in massachusetts there are fifty six per cent in rhode island fifty eight in connecticut fifty in new york fifty six and in new jersey forty eight per cent but the heaviest proportion is found in the northwestern states in wisconsin and minnesota three-fourths of the people are foreign-born or children of foreign-born and in the new state of north dakota four-fifths of the people are of immediate foreign extraction while only one-fifth of the inhabitants are of american stock in our great cities the situation is even more startling thus in boston the native element constitutes but thirty per cent in brooklyn twenty eight and in buffalo twenty two while new york with only eighteen per cent is practically a foreign city so far as its population is concerned chicago contains a native element of but twenty per cent and detroit of twenty one while among these great cities milwaukee stands at the head or foot as you please with a native element of but thirteen per cent these are presented graphically in the accompanying plate seventeen the most extreme case which has fallen under my notice however is that of the little city of ishpeming in the heart of the iron region of michigan a city of some eleven thousand people of which only six per cent are native born of native parents the remainder ninety four per cent being foreign born or the children of the foreign born summary i have attempted to sum up in a diagram plate nineteen a part of the substance of this paper this is an attempt to show the growth of each element of the population for a century with its status at the end of the century the breadth of the diagram opposite the years is proportional to the population at that date and the breadth of the various subdivisions is proportional to the numbers of the three elements colored native and foreign the immigration of each decade is indicated by the additions between the dates the separation between the elements of native and foreign blood is of course only an approximation a tentative separation was made under the assumption that the rate of natural increase of the foreign element was equal to that of the native element under this assumption the separation was carried forward to 1870 where as explained above a definite separation was made by the census enumeration this gave a correction which showed that the natural increase of the foreign element had been more rapid than that of the native element accordingly the earlier results were corrected and the rates of increase of the foreign and of the native elements thus deduced were projected forward to 1890 the diagram at the bottom shows the present status of the population as regards colored native and foreign blood classifying the last by the leading nationalities from this it appears that the present composition of the population is somewhat as follows colored seven million five hundred thousand white of native extraction 
thirty million white of foreign extraction twenty five million the principal elements of the latter are british four million irish six million five hundred thousand german six million eight hundred thousand swedes and norwegians one million hungarians five hundred thousand italians five hundred thousand canadians one million six hundred thousand the remainder of the twenty five million are distributed among various nationalities in small numbers the white element of native extraction is apparently in the minority today in this country being exceeded in number by the sum of the foreign element and the colored british blood is however still largely in the ascendant for if we add to the white native element the four million of british and six million five hundred thousand of irish we get forty million five hundred thousand about two-thirds of the entire population and three-fourths of the entire white population End of section four recording by karen